Hey guys and girls and welcome back to another simple science and technology video and in this video we will be kicking off our series of ICT systems with hardware and more specifically we'll be looking at internal hardware the kind of hardware that is critical for the operation of computer systems so things like CPU, RAM, internal hard disks so things that are critical and basically computers cannot operate without them. We're not looking at things like peripherals, like keyboards, mice, monitors, because frankly, you'll find out that computers won't need them to operate. We need them to interface with computers, okay? So things like CPU, RAM, motherboards, these are critical things that are required for computers and ICT systems to operate. So last week, we... Uh, had a brief overview of what an ICT system was and it's essentially a setup or an organization of four key things hardware software data and users so in this video we'll be looking at the first one of these uh, focuses and it's hardware okay so hardware is a collection or a physical parts or components of a computer system that are directed by software to execute commands or instructions. So, so essentially, these are the tools that hard uh, that software uses to execute its instructions and commands. Okay, so these are the physical components that you see when you interact or um, look at computer systems. So these are the physical components. Yeah, but physical components require brains they require the software in order to direct them to execute in order to direct them to work okay so hardware needs software and today we'll be looking at the physical part of this relationship and that's hardware okay so hardware is best understood as two different types of uh, hardware groups so firstly you've got internal hardware so these are things as i said which are critical for the operation of computer systems. And as such, they're typically cased inside a computer system or a, a particular unit, as you'll see later. And that's why they're called internal. These are cru uh, critical things. So imagine a human body. These devices, these hardware that are internal, are like your organs, your heart, you know, things that you need in order to live. Whereas external, uh, hardware are essentially things that you use to um, interface with your computer systems, things that you use to either input information into your computer systems or output or display them, display the information from your computer systems. Think of these as like clothing, hats, you know, clothes, your uh, sweatshirt, for example. You don't need them to live, but it helps you convey who you are, okay? So, as I said before, internal hardware are components which are crucial for the operation of computer. These are typically connected directly onto what is called a motherboard, which we will discuss in the next video. And they're typically contain contained within the computer's main body or case. So that is where we can physically see the difference between an internal hardware and external hardware is basically whatever is in the casing. And whatever's in the casing is typically what is essential for operation. In other words, it's not casings there for you to basically not pull it in and out very often. So it's meant to be in there. It's meant to be in there for an extended period of time. Okay, and the whole point of internal hardware um, as a concept is that we see internal hardware as things that make up a computer. When you think of a computer, you must have internal hardware, and the computer is the internal hardware that it is composed of. Whereas external hardware, or it's typically known as peripherals, are essentially devices that I said are used to interface with a computer, to input information or to output information from a computer. So these uh, things are like uh, your printers. So as I said, it's an output device in that it helps you display in a printed form the data from your computer, either it would be from a word processing software like Microsoft Word, or it could be, uh, for example, a mouse. It's used to input your commands from left clicking, right clicking, and moving your mouse around. Monitor to digi digitally, uh, digitally 
display your information keyboard likewise to input using the keys and they're typically connected um, to external connectors within your computers or computer systems so things like your lightning ports your USB-C um, ports you've got your SD card ports here your HDMI ports and your Ethernet cable uh, ports in order to connect with the wider network so these things are external hardware because they are connected externally to the computer and the critical thing here is that you don't need them specifically to operate yeah okay so uh, these external ports you can see them on the side of your laptop that you're using to watch uh, this video or um, uh, on the PC it's either on the front uh, lower side of uh, lower part of the PC those docks or it's on the back you always find them on the back very sophisticated bunch of ports and those are external or peripheral connectors so connectors are another word uh, for port and in this video we'll be focusing on internal hardware so let's look at what internal hardware is composed of um, let's have a, a wider review of those before we dive deep into each of the individual components so firstly you've got your CPU this is essentially the brains of the computer this is where most of the calc well this is where most of the calculation takes place of course there's and also um, video processing that's done by the GPU but on the CPU mo mainly all of billions and billions of calculations take place um, and these calculations are essentially decoded instructions from memories such as RAM and essentially all of the instructions and all the code that needs to be executed in order to get things done in order for applications to run happens at the CPU okay it's known as a central processing unit and we'll talk about it in detail later so think of it as the brains of the computer it's like a human brain in that it is where the decision making takes place it's where the decision making is centralized okay so it is a central processing unit it's typically um, one of the most expensive parts of the computer and then you've got your internal storage and these nowadays are mainly your HDDs and your SSDs hard disk drives and solid-state drives so anything from files images um, videos your application data um, things like you know databases and even in your operating systems are stored on internal drives so HDDs and SSDs and the key here is that whatever is stored on here will be kept on the HDDs and SDs, SSDs even when the power goes off okay so this is where RAM shows its difference so RAM is essentially a type of memory that is different to HDDs and SSDs in that whatever stored on the RAM once the power goes off it the data is essentially lost and this is why RAM is extremely powerful in that RAM can be used for a caching purpose in that your CPU essentially requires instructions in order to ex execute and where does it get its instructions from from a memory location so it could be from internal storage however data access from the internal storage into the CPU is not quick enough for us to get things done in the modern day as a result we need a quick access data or memory location and this is why uh, you need a type of memory that can be quickly accessed but only on a temporary basis okay and that's where random access memory comes in and that's where RAM is extremely useful for a purpose called caching and nowadays most applications run on RAM and are very very dependent on RAM especially games okay so RAM caching link those two together and you will always understand and see the difference between RAM and internal storage next you've got ROM ROM is read-only memory and do not get mixed up with ROM and HDDs and SD SSDs do not get mixed up with ROM and internal storage okay both of them are classified as permanent storage in that when power goes off the data on internal storage devices and ROM will uh, still be there but the key difference here is that read-only memory is strictly non-rewritable whereas 
internal storage memory is rewritable, as I mentioned uh, uh, many times before. So essentially, the data that is stored in ROM is burnt into the chip at the manufacturer level. So essentially, at the factory, they've burnt data onto the chip, onto this piece of firmware, essentially so that you cannot go ahead and rewrite the information on the software, uh, on um, the ROM. So essentially, it's like your DNA. You're born with the information of uh, that is your DNA, and, and it, it's it's not meant to be changed, okay? And what is then stored on the ROM? Typically, it's configuration data for computer systems. You'll hear things like BIOS, things that you'll see on the startup of your computer before you hit the operating system. And it's stored on a permanent basis, yeah? In the sense that it's literally burnt into the chip and cannot be rewritten, okay? So it's like your DNA. <laughs> And then you've got um, your um, sound cards, and these are essentially devices and integrated circuit boards that are responsible for the production of sounds in the computer. Similarly, you've got graphics cards or video cards, and these are responsible for processing and transfer of video data uh, to the viewing device like monitors. So these are actually quite similar to CPUs. Actually, they're called GPUs, graphical processing units. And they're mainly acting as a CPU, but for video data. Okay. Now, finally, to link everything together, you've got your motherboard. And that's the main platform where all these devices come together. It's a printed circuit board. You print a circuit board, uh, you know, like in electronics when you're building uh, your automated systems. And it basically allows for all of these devices. And in many cases, including external devices, uh, to communicate like a hub or like a mother bringing together her child devices. So as you can see, when it comes to internal hardware, you've essentially got seven key devices that you need to understand in depth, in, in some sort of depth um, of their operation. And typically in almost any device that you see nowadays that has some sort of display that you can interact with or humans can interact with, they need all seven of these devices. Okay, and today we'll be focusing on the main top three, uh, that is the CPU, the HDDs and SSDs, and um, the RAM. Okay, and in the next video we'll be talking about the other four. So firstly, we have the CPU, or the Central Processing Unit. It's the hardware that is responsible for taking, interpreting, and executing instructions from um, your program. So it executes code. Okay. And the process in which it executes these, um, it, it goes ahead and does its job is fetching, decoding, and executing. And I personally um, recognize that a lot of educational systems do not go ahead and teach in depth about um, the, the, the CPU processes and the CPU cycle. Uh, and I just want to mention briefly about these key processes because they are critical. And these processes operate on every single devices with CPUs uh, in the world, okay? And we need to understand this, and we need to understand it in a simple and understandable and memorable way. So firstly, you need to know that CPU is, you could understand it as a very, very super powerful calculator, okay? Because from whatever is decoded to the execution stage, the CPU essentially calculates machine code, okay? It is given instructions by the RAM to calculate machine code. It's a very, very powerful calculator. Okay, let's look at the CPU cycle, um, the fetching, decoding, and running processes. These are the three main processes that take place at the CPU. Okay, so firstly, the process of fetching involves the CPU fetching instructions from programs from the RAM. Okay, and we'll talk about RAM later. But RAM is essentially, think of it as a memory location where instructions are stored on a temporary basis. And the CPU mainly talks to the RAM to get its input. Okay, so it gets instructions from the RAM. Okay, and the instructions from the RAM is now stored in the CPU's memory location known as an immediate access RAM. So it's another type of RAM that's different from the RAM that... Um, it's getting instructions from. So the instructions from the, the RAM 
with the diagram on top there stored in the CPU's RAM okay so as you can see almost uh, even things like the your GPU and your sound cards and your video your vi they, they have RAM okay so your CPU has RAM as well okay the instructions are then passed into what is known as an instructions register in your CPU and that essentially acts as another layer of caching in order to, for your CPU to execute things on a quicker basis. Caching allows for things to happen quicker and, allow, and it reduces delay time in these connections, okay? And then you've got decoding. And this process takes the instructions from the instructions register into an interpretable form. It, it, it sort of decrypts this information into a uh, interpretable, interpretable interpretable form so that it can be executed by the, uh, the the CPU or the ALU units in the CPU okay and the thing you need to know is that when it comes to executing the ALU which is the executing unit within the CPU can only process machine code as a result the whatever instruction that is received at the instructions register must be understood by the arithmetic and logic unit, the ALU, okay? And these are typically things, you know, arithmetic calculations, okay? Ones and zeros, binary stuff, or hexabit, uh, yeah, uh, binary stuff, okay? And whatever is calculated is released as an output to the devices um, that it may impact, okay? So the executed instructions, as I mentioned before, can involve things like basic ath uh, arithmetic, comparing numbers together, and moving them around in memory, okay? And as a result, these, these things, these calculations are very simple, but they must be understood by the ALU. So that's why you need your decoder process, okay? Now, these calculations take place, you know, billions of times per second, and uh, per per CPU and it's it's absolutely insane as a result I want you to remember the CPU as a super 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 duper fast calculator okay and as you can see here there are two components um, that are critical for the data flow um, inside the CPU and these two components make up the control unit of the CPU and these are the decoder and the multiplexer as you can see it links up the key channels within the CPU, okay? And that allows it to basically dictate the flow of data within the CPU. So pretty much the two most important parts of your computer, your CPU is your decoder and your multiplexer because that allows for the balance and flow of information within your CPU and allows it to operate effectively, okay? So th those two components form what is called a control unit. The CPU is also known as a microprocessor nowadays, as of, um, is a difference in the past. In that, in the past, CPUs were made of very, di very, very many different um, units, uh, integrated circuits that are connected with within a circuit board. But now it's a single integrated um, circuit. So that's why it's called a microprocessor all in one. Okay. Now CPUs are found in all devices and mainly for uh, control and monitoring purposes, okay? So whatever thing that has control, so control means you can dictate the output of another device or to monitor, to gather input, you need a CPU, okay? Next, you've got your internal storages. And nowadays, it's typically your HDDs and SSDs. HDDs or internal hard disk drives and solid state drives, SSDs, are the computer's main storage devices, okay? They are capable of storing a huge amount of data, especially when it uh, is compared to any type of RAM. Yeah. And they can store everything, things from files, text, photos, and images, databases, application software, operating systems, okay? Your boot up operating systems are stored on HDDs and SSDs. They are known as non-volatile or permanent storage, means meaning that the uh, main key thing here is that when power goes off, the data will still be stored. So that's where it's different from RAM. So let's look at the difference between the two by firstly looking at HDDs. HDDs are a form of magnetic storage media. Where does the magnet come from? 
It consists of a disc or a platter, okay, um, a magnetic platter because it is coated with a magnetic material such as nickel. Okay, the disc itself is made up of ceramic, glass, or aluminium. And HDDs are known as electromechanical devices because it involves a spinning disc and it's powered by elect electricity. And electricity flows through it, so it's an electromechanical device. And that's where its reliability is um, a bit of a problem compared to H SSDs, which are purely electronical devices. Okay. So how an SS and a HDD works is that the coating element that's on the magnetic disc can be magnetized. In other words, the elements within the disc can be um, can flip in directions. Okay, as you can see here in the diagram that I've um, magnified uh, from the disc here, you've got red and blue elements um, facing in opposite directions, and those are basically different magnetic directions, and those represent ones and zeros <coughs> excuse me and the magnetizing is done by a device within the uh, HDD known as the read right head it's it's one of those you know like it's one of those needles that go down and, and it's similar to those uh, old music playing devices yeah and those uh, that um, head there with that needle is responsible for reading and writing onto the disc, okay, or, or from the disc. HDDs are used to store everything, and it's mainly uh, nowadays for fast retrieval and storage of data. Regardless of what you think compared to RAM or SSDs, HDD data access is actually very, very fast, okay? Um, yeah, much faster than um, a lot of stor other storage devices, and they're used in real-time systems as a result, things like robotics or online systems uh, for ticket uh, booking or file systems, even in servers. Actually, they're preferred to use in servers than SSDs, and you'll find out why. Advantages are that they, of course, they have fast data transfer and access rates, okay? Not as fast as SSDs, but it is very, very fast. And of course, fast or not is, is relative, but compared to other storage devices in the day, it is fast, okay? And you've and it's got large memory capacities. These things go up to terabytes, man. And you've got uh, disadvantages, however, in that they can be easily damaged if not correctly shut down, okay? It leads to a phenomenon known as head crash, and that essentially loses the data stored on your HDDs. Sadly, they've also got moving parts, as I mentioned before. As a result, they are less reliable than S SDs, which do not have any moving parts. So why would that be less reliable? Because you've got a mechanical element there. So for example, if something gets stuck within the mechanical operations of the disk, your disk is faulty then, okay? So, there's, so it's not just an electronical failure that can go wrong. A mechanical failure that prevents the disk from running you know um efficiently will effectively stop your system from running so there's more points of failure potential failure and finally it's it's noisy okay you've got a spinning disc and that generates vibration noise no ssds they serve the same functions as hdds they serve what internal storage devices are meant to do to store everything on a permanent basis as long as power is turned uh, even off, yeah? Okay, so um, they serve the same purpose, and instead of spinning disks, you've got NAND chips that are used and they're stuck onto your SSDs. They're, they look very, very similar to RAM, which is also um <laughs> uh, static. There's no moving parts. And these devices are quickly taking over HDDs. They serve the same purpose, but instead of spinning this, they've got static chips known as NAND chips, okay? And these chips basically consist of millions of tiny transistors, which essentially store ones and zeros. And, uh, and that's sort of like your um, HDD disk elements that go up or down in the magnetic direction. And as a result, they create a type of read-writable memory that's volatile. And effectively, this forms a... Uh, non-volatile rewritable memory okay and the advantages 
of an SDD is that it is reliable. There are no moving parts. Um, so there are no points of mechanical failure. It's lighter, thinner, and cooler. It's like a RAM. And that makes it more suitable for use in a laptop. You know, your uh, HDDs are pretty thick. So in comparison, you've got SD SSDs, which are very, very thin and can be slotted very, very neatly into modern day laptops, which must be portable um, for use. Okay. They consume less power than HDDs, which means it is more economically uh, beneficial. They are thinner, lighter, and cooler. Okay. Mentioned. Um, due to the lack of mechanical component, there is no need for the disk to start spinning at the operational velocity for the device to operate optimally. So, startup time is negligible. You don't have to wait for these disks to start spinning. Once you boot the operating systems on, it goes. Okay. So, th also they uh, run at a temperature much cooler than HDDs. Again further explaining their preference use in laptops. And finally, they allow for faster access, um, uh, data access. And that is the key performance benefit that justifies why SSDs are more commonly used than HDDs. Okay, however, there is a main disadvantage of SSDs. And it's got to do with the technolog technological state, as of right now, of the device. And it's known as SSD endurance. <coughs> Excuse me. Due to their durability, the operation of most SSDs are conservatively limited to only about 20 gigabytes of write operations a day. And as a result, they are actually not used in internet servers as uh, prevalently as HDDs because in terms of durability, HDDs are more durable. So you've got your balance between durability and reliability. But eventually, this durability problem will be um, will be fixed, and SSDs will be prevalent in servers everywhere in the world. And finally, for today, we've got RAM, which is essentially an internal chip um, that allows for caching to take place. It's a middleman where data can be stored temporarily to be quickly accessed by the CPU, and it temporarily stores data of applications uh, currently and part of the operating systems that are in use. So it's all about data that are, is currently in use within the session, within the instance. And I'll give you a, a very, very clear example how RAM works with um, internal storage. Okay, but firstly, you need to understand that data can be written or read from the RAM just like your internal storages. But it's read at a much faster rate and it's read uh, in a volatile basis in that when data is stored on RAM and the power goes off, everything is deleted. So let's look at an example of how RAM operates. So let's say you're trying to create a Word document and your internal storage device stores the Word uh, application, right? So what happens is when you go to create a Word document, it copies empty document onto the RAM, it copies the application software and the empty document onto the RAM, okay, which will then open on your client computer, on your client uh, monitor when you go ahead and press it. And let's say you make a, uh, a, a, a you type a, a sentence or add some images to the Word document. Essentially, what you're doing is you're adding a few bytes of Word or um, your uh, your image data onto the RAM. So it doesn't go directly to the internal storage yet, okay? And when you go ahead and click save, oh sorry, when you go ahead and make that change, it goes ahead and updates your document view or whatever you see on your screen. So your RAM here not only processes your request of typing or adding images, it also updates you with whatever you need to see or basically responds to your request. And when you go ahead and press save, it then stores your progress onto the internal storage. It stores your saved file onto the internal storage. So remember, when you go when you use Word, you are not directly saving onto the internal storage until you press save. Whatever you're seeing on the screen is due to your RAM storing and updating and responding to your request on whatever you're writing. 
So what happens if you do the same process, but now you power off your machine before you even saved? Of course, that means you can't save, right? Because whatever's stored on your RAM now will be deleted. So you can't go ahead and save it. So that is why in recent days, uh, Microsoft Word has gone ahead and implemented a autosave process that detects an abrupt shutdown to allow for data to be saved onto the hard disk. And only when you go ahead and choose that autosave the next time you restart your computer, it will actually uh, redisplay whatever y uh, work you've done and did not mean to um, shut down. Similarly, let's look at gaming. So when you start up a game, let's say Modern uh, Warfare, you load it onto your RAM, okay? Your internal storage device doesn't go straight up to um, w w um, your display and it, you don't directly interact with your internal storage. You go ahead and open your internal storage. Let's say when you're in your game, you, you, you shoot your enemy, yeah? When, you, when you're actually shooting, what you're doing is you're requesting a shot to take place within the game, okay? Within the application of the game. So what that does is the RAM will respond to you uh, saying, you know, okay, you've done your shot. You know, there's an image or there's a, there's a process of you recoiling uh, from that shot. So the RAM updates your game process, okay? And this RAM could be uh, that RAM stick or it could be the RAM from the GPU, but either way, it's from RAM, okay? And when you go ahead and finish, let's say, your mission, so after uh, this loop of um, shooting requests and updating the game progress temporarily for you, only when you actually save the game process progress do you actually store anything on your internal store on a permanent basis. So that's why they always recommend you to save Okay, because only when you prompt the save, unless there's autosave, do you actually store anything on a permanent basis on your internal storage. Okay, so that's all uh, for RAM, CPU, and HDDs and SSDs today. We'll be looking at um, the other remaining four internal hardware devices on another time. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I hope this has been useful. And um, I'm going to try to set up quizzes for you guys. So um, you know, check out the description whenever it comes. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. And thank you so much for your support.